there's a famous place where there are approximately 50 suicides a year, which is called The Gap, which is in New South Wales. And there's an institute that are looking to put sensors in and around that area so that when individuals go to this area, they would ideally like to be able to tap into those individual health records to see if they had a predisposition or some mental health illness beforehand so they can save a life. Now, the question then is, would exposing all of this information to save a life be the right thing to do? Or would some individuals believe that it incurs on their day of privacy? Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Today's guest is Craig Rollins, the general manager of Medibank. Craig is an ambitious leader with a proven track record for delivering major projects, including data management, production, and business intelligence solutions, and is a highly experienced and technical analyst with a clear understanding of the strategic importance of data warehousing, business intelligence, and analytical software within an information-dependent business. On this episode, Craig and Cindy discuss the life and cost-saving benefits of leveraging data to improve decision-making in healthcare, how moving from financial services to healthcare has given Craig a more holistic view of what's possible with data, why an individual should never stop learning and broadening their skills at any age, and establishing beneficial relationships with vendors that make you partners in each other's success. All that and more on today's episode with Craig Rollins. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for you to use search and AI to analyze your company's data lightning fast. Business people at companies like Walmart, Hulu, and Medtronic use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can too. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, all the way from Australia is Craig Rollins from Metabank. Welcome, Craig. Thank you very much, Cindy. Nice to be on the show. Great. Now, Craig, right now you're in Australia, but I understand you hail originally from England. Yeah, that's true. About eight, nine years ago, we came over for a holiday. And as lots of people do in Australia or appear to do, um, there was a coffee set up and um, on the back of the coffee set up was a, a job offer. Oh, wow. Now, so... <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go coffee straight away. And my friends in Melbourne will be saying, is this the Luna coffee? Which is just, if you haven't had it yet, it's so awesome. Um, yeah, it was Luna. So, um, and you know that there are coffee snobs in, in Australia anyway. So I've now become a coffee snob. <laughs> well, I confess I became a coffee snob while living in, in Switzerland. And then coming back to the US, it was a little hard to drink the, the watered down coffee there. This is pre-Starbucks, pre-Blue Bottle and all these things. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So we so we share love for both coffee and data. Yep. So that's good. And then I'm also going to have to tell you, so I understand we met a few years ago at an event, but we don't know each other that well. And yet I learned that you also have a commendation from the Royal Air Force. So tell us about that. And how do you go from the Air Force to data? Okay. I don't normally talk about the commendation. Okay. So this is, this is an interesting one for me. So, and, and not many people know about this. The commendation was actually, um, they call it the Air Officers number one group, but it's one of about 20 people out of 90,000 normally get an award. I think it's somewhere on the bottom of the Queen's Birthdays Honours list. In this case, I was observing a live grenade throwing um, exercise and the grenade was dropped by the individual and I grabbed the grenade, threw it out of the pit and apparently it was for bravery at the end of the day. Um, so, as I said, I don't talk about it too often, but it's um, it, it obviously it's there, it's done, it's on record and then afterwards I was um, I was shaking like a leaf. So um, I drank, um, it wasn't coffee this time, I drank lots of sugared tea. So, um, so, th so there you go. It's, um, 
it's a quiet one for me. That's yeah, sec- second yeah. life I've saved, let's say. Yeah. Wow. And now back really in a way of saving lives, but in a, or serving lives, improving patient care. Um, yeah. So didn't want to put you on the spot there. Didn't know that yeah. was going to be this story. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so no, thank you for the bravery. And so my, my father-in-law, may he rest in peace, served in the Royal Navy. So uh, my husband's English, we follow these things. So uh, that definitely caught my attention. Tell us now. So you started really in financial services. Now you're the general manager of information management at MetaBank. So a very different sector. Give us an overview of MetaBank, what it does, and how you're using data to improve patient care. Yeah, Cindy, um, you're right. It's very different for me. So I try and do different industries anyway, but um, I will always argue that data is data and you can use that for the power of good or potentially the power of bad. In this case, the power of good. So Medibank um, are traditionally known as a health insurer um, and they have two brands. They have Medibank and AHM for, for different age populations effectively. But um, that insurance is there for, I would say, a very large number of the Australian community. But the the bit that probably excites me more than the health insurance is the health services element. So this is, you talked about this this element for for saving lives, et cetera, for doing the power of good. This is where Medibank provide things like chemotherapy in the home, dialysis in the home, cardiac rehabilitation in the home. And and it's all driven towards making lives better for Australians, you know, uh, their health and wellbeing. So... We do the facet of, of, of the policies and obviously keeping premiums down and, and making sure claims costs are down, et cetera. To me, they're, they're, they're foundational. The health services is really the exciting element. I think the element where we can give so much more back. Yeah, so chemo in the home, especially if we think in a COVID era where some people are delaying care, that's huge. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you're right, that, that's gone up. So the increase in... Um, chemotherapy in a home because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in have gone up and you're right I mean but even in an in a normal day scenario imagine if you were in a rural area you had to travel to hospital you had to have the therapy you had to come back from the hospital I mean that's that's a pretty tiring day all in all out one of our videos shows a, a lovely guy called Liam who's got leukemia he's only young but he actually has his chemotherapy in the home I think he's watching Netflix with his dog on his lap um, and then he goes back to his own room to to have a small nap, and and then he's feeling so much better. I mean, that's a that's a vastly different patient outcome, member outcome, sort of one of travelling, you know, many miles to a hospital and back. Yeah, yeah, much more gentle, I would say, uh, yeah. rather than traumatizing. So that's wonderful. And you also spoke about one thing I know MetaBank does is try to give patients data to make an informed decision about do they do a procedure, do they undergo a procedure. And in a way, just getting costs, that is an impossibility in in the US, for example. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, sure, Cindy. Um, Yeah, there's a few things. So we look at the cost, we give them a view of what the cost will be for a procedure, um, an operation. So there's, there's a lot of guidance behind that because for most people, and, and I was one of them, right, for, for my procedure, typically we would think that the most expensive of the procedures probably means that you're getting the best outcome. The data says that's not true, right? And we know that. So it's actually the provision of, you know, what would be the the recommended amount, what would be the the average amount. And then from that point onwards, then there is of the practitioners, which practitioners have got a good record, which practitioners have possibly not got such a good record. Now that's not highly published, but there is a a listing of of practitioners available to customers. So you can make an informed choice about the cost of an operation or procedure, the individual, and you can do some fact finding behind it. And even the procedure itself, so when they ask, and you know, I use myself as a typical example, I asked about the procedure for my heart bypass. And during that conversation, there was two. There was the traditional open good old Craig up at the front or going from the side as a, as a robotic surgery. And there was the implications behind both surgeries in terms of how invasive they are and recovery. 
um, rehabilitation. So, so those are the informed choices that we try and provide people much the same as I would say a financial services organization should be around APR rates, you know, repayment um, time periods, et cetera, for your dream home for a mortgage. And that's the why I look at, this is the kind of thing that we should be doing for individuals from a health perspective. Yeah, so I didn't want to put you on the spot again, but thank you for sharing that personal story. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, we're glad you're okay, fully I'm recovered. Very, are, are you back to recovered. playing soccer? Yes, um, COVID has stopped me playing soccer, but um, but yes, I am back to playing soccer. Um, I, or uh, football, I should say football. football. <laughs> That's right. I play it twice a week, so it's um, generally Wednesday's training and a weekend game. Um, and remember, I'm in a mature league, right? So I'm a little older. But, it's okay. Um, My husband I, is in the over fifties league. I say it should be the over sixties league. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there you That's go. Good. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> but it, it gets me out of the house. It, it gets me exercising, which I think is great. And it's um, it's an absolute passion of mine. So, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself running seven, eight kilometers uh, a training session. I'm one of, I think, one of the fitter ones. So, um, and all I'll say about the bypass is it's taken me from 75% engine efficiency to 100%. So, why why would i argue with that as an outcome yeah excellent excellent so you went into this um not too long after you joined metabank and you understand the data and you understand now how a patient might use it but also how doctors and insurers are using it when you think about this event has it changed how you prioritize what you want metabank to be delivering with data it's changed a lot of things, Cindy. Um, yeah, I can an imagine. Event of, an event of that yeah. nature. Um, yes, I think it's the answer. Like, um, and remember, that, as you said, I mean, I, I joined from typically banking, finance, and insurance, and and I, I think there becomes a, a, a point in, in maybe all of our lives as we we get to more senior levels that we can pick and choose the roles that we want. So I was always drawn to a role of this kind anyway because I felt that. Based on my experience, I can probably do a lot of good in, in a role for, for a company like Medibank. So that was the first thing. Now, if you, you kind of add this element on top of it and you say, well, based on the experience that I've had, what insight can I provide? So for instance, when they were completing the cardiac rehab habilitation at home, I was somebody that was interviewed with regard to what my experience was on, on the rehabilitation within a hospital. And I can tell you, some of it was very good and some of it wasn't very good because I'm traditionally speaking, probably quite a young individual from a high bar price perspective. I'm obviously, I think a lot fitter than, than many of the individuals that, that go for it. So my expectation when I came out of, of that surgery and my rehabilitation was, and we were very clear with, with my cardiothoracic surgeon was, I will be getting back to exactly where I was before, if not better. Now, for some people, that isn't the case. Some people just want to effectively be alive. And, you know, to me, the cardiac rehabilitation was, there are a set of guidelines and I was pushing very hard against those, Cindy, I always do. But um, for me, the physio probably had quite a hard time reining me back in. But my view was, you're setting this for somebody who's 60 odd, probably a lot more yeah. overweight than I am, probably not as fit. So I can see why you would add an element of caution, but for somebody like myself, you know, I should be pushing a lot harder to get the outcomes that I'm looking for. Now, obviously, if I'm not doing things dangerously, then then that's a great outcome. So it was slow and steady to start. And then there was a very big build up to the point where in October, Medibank have a, they call it the Medibank marathon or half marathon. And I'd signed up for a 10 kilometer. And my physio had said, there's no way you're doing a 10 kilometer so soon after your rehab. And I'm going to be at the race. So if I'm there, you're not going to be there. Okay. Wow. So, and this is only a couple months after. Yeah, it's a couple of months after. Right? But, okay. but, but I was going really well, yeah. Cindy. So um, anyway, I did it, but I didn't do the race with her. I did the race uh, around local streets and I beat her time. So um, so we were. That's awesome. We had, a, we had a good chuckle about it afterwards. And, I, and her concern was more around a caution point of view, clearly. And mine was. I needed to prove to myself that I could get back out and do it. Well, and part of it too, she's informing her guidelines around a biased data set. Um, Absolutely. You know, 
taking the conservative view. I think um, maybe this is one of, maybe this was the trip when you and I met one of the first times I was talking about data for good was actually at a Gartner Sydney conference. And I took an example from Australia where insurers in Australia were anonymizing the data and making it available to the public for data-driven decisions. And it had actually backfired because the data was not adequately anonymized, it seems. And I said, even though this backfired, to me, we have to try. There's more good than harm that can happen. So here we are in a global pandemic. Metabank owns so much data. What is your view of this? How do we respect privacy while also leveraging it for the greater good? Yeah, and that's um, that's a that's a really difficult question actually because different people have different views around the privacy of, of their information. And I'll probably throw that back in a couple of ways because there's a few scenarios around around this, and there's a few stories that that come back. And I'll probably start soft and go a little hard here. So um, Rand Bank in, in South Africa, they use AI. And in their view, they will take a picture of an individual and they'll send it off to the government agency and the government agency will send that back to say, yes, I confirm that's the picture of said individual and they will be able to open up a savings account. Now, AI is a power of good is great. And in, in South Africa, that's seen as a norm and most people are, are okay with that ethically. So there's an easy one. But over in in Australia, there's a, there's a famous place in where there are approximately 50 suicides a year, which is called The Gap, which is in, in New South Wales. And, and there's an institute that are looking to put sensors in and around that area so that when they, when individuals go to this area potentially to commit harm to themselves, they would ideally like to be able to tap into those individuals' health records to see if they had a predisposition or some, some mental health illness beforehand so they can save a life. Now, the question then is, you know, would exposing all of this information to save a life be the right thing to do? Or would some individuals believe that it incurs on their day of privacy? And the answer is probably both scenarios are right. And it, it, it's a case by case basis for me, depending on the circumstances behind it. Yeah, um, so many interesting challenges. So the good, even for the individual but maybe they just don't want that at that point yeah. in time. Unfortunately not. I know in my view, I would say if it saves a life, what a fantastic outcome. But yeah. as I said, some individuals would, would decline that offer. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. I read a quote in um, CIO magazine in Australia that Australian companies, and excuse my expression, I didn't write this, the editor yeah. wrote this, suck at data and analytics. All right. Okay. What's um, your reaction? And this, <laughs> I do have to timestamp it. Um, so I, I, this article was 2018. Would you still agree with this? Would you even have ag agreed with it then? And I mean, he, the editor attributed it to a couple different things. So a, a culture, a risk averse culture, lack of talent, and reluctance to experiment. Again, I'm going to say yes and no. So some some clearly don't. Look, there are things that I was doing in the UK ten years ago that still aren't being done in Australia. Like what? Well, here's an example. So for a, for an insurance company before, we were using voice risk analysis with regard to claims. So within that, we'd um, we'd effectively measured an individual to see via a questionnaire. So there's a baseline set of questions to get a baseline with regard to somebody's voice. So if somebody's typically telling an untruth, they would have pregnant pauses in there that potentially a human couldn't, couldn't um, measure. And their voices would go up small amount of octaves, again, which a human may not be able to measure. But actually using AI, voice risk analysis, you can do. So that you can predict whether an individual is lying. Now, I use the, the, uh, an, an obvious example of, you know, somebody may have lied about an insurance claim, but they actually may have only partially lied about it. So they may have just have embellished it. And the reasoning behind that is I pay my premiums every year. Therefore, I want something back. That's, that's typically what happens. And then using the questionnaire and using the voice risk analysis and using a store process to fire that back. And remember, we're talking about 
a subset of questions and a subset of, of, of responses to that, we can go back to the agent in, in a very quick time period for them to be able to put an individual on hold, assess that information and have a predictive outcome that's fairly accurate up to in and around 80 or percent plus that says an individual is either completely lying or partially lying about insurance claim. And then the agent can then go back to the individual and say something like, we believe some or part of the, um, the claim is fraudulent. We're going to complete further investigations. You now have the ability to withdraw the claim if you so wish. When, when that speech is put forward to, to the customer, who potentially is, 70% of them retract the claim. Wow. It's a huge amount. So, so the benefit is there. Oh, it's clearly there. The benefit is clearly there. Yeah. So that it's happening, it's there. And so you were doing that 10 years ago in the UK. Is it yeah. unheard of or just emerging in Australia? I would say, and I talk about this example quite a lot uh, with Australian counterparts because it's not used widely. You know, we're, we're talking about um, a, a small amount of use cases, yet they've got other ones where they're using things like Splunk um, to look at multiple IP addresses or the same IP address for fraudulent activity. So, so there are a number of different ones that are being used, and that's why I say it's um, it's a broad stream in Australia. People will say that there's not a lot of talent in Australia. I would argue that Australia have done a lot to bring talent in globally as well. So if I think about my time at ANZ Bank, the vast majority of the team actually was not Australian. Um, they were European or American in the modeling team and in the data management team. But with the view of educating Australians to bring them up to that kind of capability that their counterparts are at. So, and that's happening. So. I, I don't think they're as far behind as they were before. And if you pick other companies that um, are fairly out there and doing some wonderful things like Atlassian, then then I would say no. It's it's a it's yeah. a broad broad. It's a broad now. brush. They they yeah. had the survey was actually done by At uh, Kearney, but I think so. There was a wide sample, and of course, the ones that I hear from are the ones written in the press, the ones that yeah. spoke at our thought leaders tours. I mean, I'm thinking of like NAB, um, Suncorp, yeah. Crown, all very, very innovative. So it's clear the best of the best is getting written about and talked about. Yeah. But maybe there's still a ways to go as, as a country or a region. What about cloud? Is that now being embraced more? Do you see that that's accelerated? Yeah, um, I think a few years ago, the regulators were, were very anti-cloud um, from an Australian point of view. Now, I think they're very pro-cloud. So, like Medibank, there's, there's no secret there, are cloud first adoption, AWS is, is our preferred one. There are three main cloud providers in Australia. The third one, the most recent one is, uh, is GCP, Google. But, um, AWS and, and Microsoft have been there for a while. And certainly, as you've mentioned, Cindy, a lot of the larger organizations have adopted the cloud. So either fully or at least as a hybrid. And like us, I think a lot of them are moving towards the outcomes that cloud can provide. I think a few of them had a bill shock when they first joined because they haven't looked at what they're doing on the cloud to make sure it's as productive as it should be from a cost optimization point of view. So they might be getting the outcomes they're looking for, but you know, I look at this and I, and I would say, if a server doesn't need to be on 24 by seven, 365 days a year, don't turn it on Yeah, because it's consumption based model. Yeah. So changing the behavior, you can't just leave it on. <laughs> You're paying somebody no, else for that you can't. now. Yeah. Uh, what about the, the other argument I hear is, well, the compute costs. So they do get a shock from the bill. And the compute cost might be higher, but but never before could they have even run that algorithm or done that those analytics or served that many users. Do you agree or disagree? Agree. So um, for us, the obviously the COVID pandemic um, is a timely example, but um, we were streaming telephony data so that people can do call forecasting for nurses on call, and we would have done we did that on AWS for us. That probably wouldn't have been possible elsewhere to be able to do that and do that so rapidly. And we're talking, you know, within a day. So I would say the ability to scale up and scale down compute cost or not that you've got from multiple data centers, the hot failover from the availability zones, if you've architected things correctly, 
give you that ability to stay up you know in case of there's an issue as well so so to me there are a lot of great outcomes and there's also you know if people look carefully from an aws point of view as an example you can reserve instances so if you know you're going to use them you know some months in advance you know secure them you know for 12 months in advance or 36 months in advance you know take the 20 30 percent saving so you'd be foolish not to yeah yeah and there are other things like um spot so you know if it's not something that's that's time precious look at some spot instances and and see what reductions you can get from those outcomes so i think there's many tricks for those of us who have now been on cloud for a while to keep the cost down and based on our experiences i think we're getting some exceptionally good outcomes yeah great so you mentioned covid and new questions as it relates to scheduling nurses um, shifts and things like this. If you think from a, both the data as well as the BI and analytics architecture, how has cloud impacted that? Or it, has it impacted what you're implementing, what your strategy is? How has it impacted the budgets? I'd say for me, favorably. So, But whether it's cloud or not, I think you need to have a clear strategy and, mm -hmm. and you need to have a clear roadmap. So I, I, I probably go back slightly further than that to say, when I first joined Medibank and when anybody of a senior nature probably joins anywhere else, things probably aren't going as well as they should be. I think that's, that's the reason most have brought in. So for me, there was, um, there was a lot of what I would class as low hanging fruit. So we didn't discuss any uh, vendor contracts and that they needed some, some reviews. We had multiple data warehouses. Clearly, we don't need multiple data warehouses. Yeah, we call we had... those data marts. <laughs> <laughs> and, if you've got and... multiple, it's not an enterprise data warehouse. It's, it's a data mart. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, Cindy. And then, yeah, you know, what typically happens if things aren't going well, people don't determine they go to the data team. They determine that they're going to go and do it themselves. So it's either takes too long, it costs too much. Oh, do you know what? I'm just going to go and do it myself. So you've got all of these, I class them as cottage industries, and then they've all got their own flavor of a tool set that they want. So for me... Just corralling all of that and resolving yeah. for that meant that from a Medibank point of view, we got lots of cost efficiencies, we got lots of reduction in risk, and and we got lots of capability uplift. So they were they were good starts to, to my tenure. And then over time as we've migrated more and more into into AWS, we've done those things that you were talking about where we've we've split sensitive and non-sensitive data as it's coming in to to that enterprise data warehouse so that gives a, a high degree of security around the information that we've got that's of a sensitive nature you know pii information you know um, medical health information i would suggest you know commercially sensitive contracts general ledger type information so well, our crown jewels as such are, are very well guarded. And I think about what, we, what you already get from a mature cloud provider. They already give you a foundation worth of information security anyway. Yeah. So some would say, or, or there still is a fear that the cloud is less secure or that maybe the customer, MetaBank or whichever, if it's financial services, is not in total control do you agree or disagree with that? Is the cloud more secure, less secure, or just differently secure? I'd say it's differently secure. And remember, you know, you're the you're the owner, regardless. So um, yeah, you're responsible. Absolutely, it's a shared responsibility responsible. model. Yeah, uh, yeah, Cindy. So so regardless of of who the provider is for the for the data center that you're on, ultimately you're accountable for it. You're you're responsible. So so you need to put the measures in. And you need to put the controls in that you believe are adequate enough to meet your risk appetite, regardless of what a cloud provider or a local provider would do anyway. So the cloud provider could give you X amount of controls in there already. And you may determine that you want to go further than that. So and I'll use the example of they'll give you encryption at rest and they'll give you encryption at flight. They won't give you data masking. And then you need to determine when you want to apply data masking and on, and on what. So so that's where the difference is around your accountability and your responsibility in comparison to a cloud. They'll give you all the tools that you need as a, as a foundational level. You need to leverage what tools are out there and what you want as a control mechanism against your company's risk appetite. Yeah. 
So Craig, you, you're brought in as a change agent, a leader. You mentioned the low hanging fruit. You talk about identifying these multiple data warehouses or data marts. Talk us through what, what was the first thing you tackled or how did you get the buy-in from the people? Was it the people, the technology that there's a better way that we've got to consolidate? We've got to change how we store things and who owns what? Talk us through that. Yeah. So, so typically when, when we all go in, there's a, there's an area or there's a time period of investigation where you're in a bit like Brubaker, I would say from as a, as a prison warden um, who went in as a prisoner, but you're in, you're trying to immerse yourself in all of that information to get, to get the outcomes that you're looking for. And from that insight, you, you can then determine, a, I was going to say a plan of attack, but, but actually some of mine were, were fairly obvious. So when when I went in and I had lots of conversations with stakeholders, it was pretty clear that they weren't happy with with the environment, um, the fact right. that there was a number of, of warehouses. So a lot of these were were fairly obvious. And I think when I read the data strategy that was provided by by an external consultancy, probably at the time, that may have been the flavor of the month. But when you look at that over the course of time. And, and you determine that if we are going to use a cloud first strategy, and that was a Medibank strategy way above what I would do, and, and, and I would be in agreement of it anyway, a cloud first strategy, then, then things needed to change. And they needed to change quickly in some cases to resolve for risk outcomes and obviously more steadily. But, but even from a vendor point of view, Cindy, the conversations with the vendors are, so one of the first conversations I had with one of the vendors for the data warehouses, um, he was very direct and he said, um, Craig, are, are we still going to be here in 12 months? And, and, and my answer to that was, it really depends on the proposition that you're you're willing to put forward and the strategic outcome that we can both work towards. I mean, if you're a strategic vendor, then then I'm very open-minded. Then they're a partner. Yeah. Then they're, then they're a partner, not a vendor. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm told so I have to banish this word from my vocabulary, vendor. <laughs> Yeah, or you're maybe right. Some are. Yeah, you're right. They are. They become a partner, right? And then it's a it's a vested interest for both of you. If if they're an individual who just wants to sell you the biggest server, and then when support is required, they're not there. That's not a partner strategically. So so those conversations were had with with contracts going forward, looking at the various tool sets, reducing them down to so even in my own team, right? So to do data mapping. We had Visio, Excel, which are standard ones. We had Erwin, we had EA Sparks. Now, having four different tool sets and having four different ways of doing things clearly doesn't allow for standardization in the team, doesn't um, allow for an evolving of the process. So quickly it was, a, okay, so you've got four, you can only have one. I don't mind which one you choose, but choose one and choose one wisely because that's what we're staying with. Now we did. And that's led to much better outcomes from data mapping perspectives. And from that, we've got much more accuracy around how that data flows through the data warehouse as well. Right. So you've got the stakeholders that were glad you were there because they wanted a better place. You have they probably vendors. weren't initially, Cindy. Oh, really? Went away. So when oh, because they away. wanted to do it themselves. <laughs> well, well, initially, yes, right. So, so initially, they did want to do it themselves, and they want. But then, if you, if you kind of remind them and say, okay, so you guys can do it yourself, but remember, you're accountable to the regulator when the regulator comes in. So, you know, you need to let them know that you've got the right controls and checks. In in our case, from from an information security perspective, from a data risk management perspective. So, so my question to you is. If you want to hold it, you own it all of it. So, do you want to stand in front of the regulator and, and walk through your controls and checks around the data? You know the answer, right? As I know the yeah. answer, they're, they're difficult conversations. Yeah, they don't want you to be the data gatekeeper. They want you to protect them from the risk. But then it's really about enabling the insight, enabling the analytics, yep. but protecting them from the risk. And and to I think built up over years, it's been more that information management or IT might just say no, and they're the gatekeeper only. And you're right. 
that needs to be turned around to say how do we how do we do that safely so you know we're there to safeguard you and you're you're right i, I don't want to stop anybody doing any analytics because m the more insight we've got the better the outcomes right so so, so to me then we need to be doing more of it not not less of it what i need to provide them as you've stated is is a safe environment to be able to do that and that's what we're looking for providing them the right tools to be able to do so as well so um and in some cases education to it to be able to, to utilize those tools so that's where we want to go forward and as i said when i first walked in to i think the steering committee with regard to the data warehouses the first question that was asked of me and i think it was you know probably to test was what what do you think of the data strategy um and i went yeah i read it it's a 168 page real oh. page turner by the way um, <laughs> a, a lot of the pages are duplicated may i say but actually it doesn't make sense so you know i was quizzed directly and i explained why i didn't feel like it made sense either and it was it was actually and i'll tell you now it, it was there was a proliferation of sql servers so i'd said to them this data strategy tells me that you're breeding SQL servers like rabbits. And I'm not sure that's what we want as an out, as an outcome. And as you said, I would typically look at something from an enterprise outcome rather than we've hit capacity on this SQL server. Oh, let's add another one. We've hit capacity. Let's add another one. Okay, wait, I have to just clarify this. So the strategy was recommending all these multiple SQL servers. Yes. Not that was the current state. No, no, it was a recommendation. Okay. So, Cindy, like you, I'm I not was... going to ask you who created this. <laughs> we we won't go there. <laughs> I'll um, yeah, I'll protect the guilty on this one. We'll edit that. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not a strategy. That's a current state to be cleaned up. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I agree with you entirely. Not a great outcome. Yeah. Quickly, we needed to pivot from that because my view was, as you as you've quite rightly pointed out, that was probably more of a current state rather than a future state that we would like to adopt. Yeah. So so you talked about the strategy, the stakeholders, the vendors. I wanted to ask you about the team, the team that you inherited. How did you connect with them, get them marching in the same direction? Talk, because you also had a role at GE that I think was a very interesting title, the data change leader. And we talk about change management is a really tough thing but a necessary thing if you're going to lead your organization forward. Yeah, I think look, um, re on reflection, I was, I was, I was quite honest with them, and I, I always try to be very honest with my team anyway, so they, they know where they where they stand. I'm not I'm not going to beat around the bush either. So the, the first conversation was, you know, I've been brought in because things aren't going as well as they could be, and I think, you know, you're all adults and you all know this, so. So how do we work together to make sure the outcome's a better outcome for, for everybody? And we're talking about our customers, our stakeholders, and you guys, right? I mean, simply put. And I had shown them all of the cottage industry, so all of the people who are doing analytics, all the people doing reporting, all of the people who are doing information management and data management around the organization. I said, all, all of these individuals, bluntly, are, are a threat to your role, particularly those that, that, that purport to be doing data management. So. You have a choice here. You know, if we continue to do the things that we're going to do at the moment, so we've got a reputation for slow delivery. Now, and the comeback to me was, well, Craig, it's really accurate. I went, great. I love that. I love the accuracy. So now it's a case of maintaining that accuracy, but speeding up. So let's have a look at what we can do and how we can standardize outcomes. And I use a data mapping as an example. Um, and over time that was an improvement and, and let's have a look at some of the other things that we've got so you know one of the other things that i inherited when i came in was there was a very old business objects um, bi reporting platform had two thousand plus reports and i'd, I'd asked them and i said who reads all of these two thousand reports if you don't mind me asking and there was no view of who's viewing them who's got what reports etc now on the basis of a of a Two week exercise of just ringing and speaking and, and discussing with stakeholders. 2,000 reports for 184. Now that freed up a lot of time to improve outcomes. So you were still giving the 184 reports, which I still think was too many at the time, by the way, and it's a lot less now. You're still giving the 184 reports that people are reading um, that they value, but you've actually cut away all of that waste that you didn't require. And that's freed individuals up to do other things 
of an improved nature. And of course, the customer started seeing this to say, oh, well, he values the stuff that we want to read, but he doesn't value the stuff that we don't want to read. And then he's not gonna just produce things for producing sake, great. And that's freed up an individual to work on something else that they never would have worked on before on our behalf. So slowly but surely you can see the team and the stakeholders coming together more than they ever have before. Yeah, so 2000 reports. So I'm <laughs> now yes. I'm wondering if I I don't I don't know if if you know my first trip to Australia was for a business objects conference probably in 2004. That was state of the art at the time. So we talk about reducing the number of reports and now in May this year, Gartner published a report, the top 10 data and analytics trends, identifying that the dashboard is on decline. So we're trying to get rid of all these pre-built things, replacing it with AI, AI-generated insights. Do you think this is too soon or no, this is state of the art keeps changing and we need to get there? I think we need to get there. Um, look, there's a place for dashboards. I, I, I don't doubt that, but but you don't need a dashboard for dashboard's sake, right? It, a report, a dashboard, whatever it is, gives you a view of the information. From there, you have to gather the outcome behind that. So dashboards have been around for, for, for many years. And for me, even if I look at, I'm going to call it a data quality dashboard that's in there, as long as that's got the ability to drill through for me to see the actual metric and whether the metric itself is important or not to us as a business from a decision making perspective and then if it is if it's not performing in the way that we want where is it not performing and can i address it as source can then the dashboard's got great yeah 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 so, yeah so so it's got value cindy but um if it's not giving me the insight i require then I need to pivot from that dashboard to to be able to answer the questions that I should be answering. Yeah, makes sense. So if you look, you know, going from financial services into healthcare, staying in the data space for so long, there's, yep. I, I say it's the great data and analytics fishbowl. We just pop up in new roles when, when we love numbers and data. But if you think back, was there ever a time you just thought, this is too hard, or this is going to be a massive failure? And how did you navigate that i'm not sure that this is going to be a massive failure it's too hard i think the that period for me was probably early in my career and and the question for me was ultimately did the individual leading the team believe in me and 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 they made it very clear they didn't believe in me because i didn't come through a traditional data route you know, I came effectively from a front line in this case, because when I left the, the Air Force, I joined First Direct Internet Telephone Bank, one of the first ones. But during that time period, I joined in the risk team and I was, I was assisting customers in financial difficulties. And I'd use that information to inform a lot of the risk strategies and the analysis that was going on. Now that the individual concern that I could only do it in that area and risk, first of all, because that's what they felt all I, all, all I knew. And they felt that my skills were limited. And remembering that I was relatively new into a role, first of all. So of course my skills are going to be limited. But I think that their view was because I hadn't come through a more traditional route into the team, they didn't see it as value. They saw it as kind of a short-term one. And in the end, you know, we've spoken many years afterwards about it. But, but part of the driving force behind me doing what I do now was was that individual and, and proving them wrong. So proving them wrong. So did you have to leave or did did that individual leave? So they made assumptions about you. Yeah. They they made assumptions based on current skills rather than aptitude, which is a lot yes. of problems with, with <laughs> recruiting. <laughs> yeah. Um but when you're young, you say, Okay, maybe they're right or I'm gonna prove them wrong. Did you have to leave? I left, Cindy, you're right. So um, there was a choice matter, right? Because it, that career was gonna stagnate where I was. And it was clear that, that individual had a, had a lot of sway anyway. Um, as I said, they, you know, they were in the kind of role that I'm in today. So there was you know, a junior data analyst com compared to a, a GM. There's no comparison. If you, if you wanna stay in that field, move, find a role. And I did, and I, and I found a role and I moved into 
fraud analytics and I proved my and I deliberately picked something different from risk and financial services as and then I moved into um, decision systems an implementation of decision systems because I wanted to broaden and each step along that journey particularly in the early days was as much about my desire to prove that I can do it to myself and to this individual. Yeah. So proving it to yourself, having confidence from within, I think is always way more important than what others think of you. I like this quote from an author, Mike Robbins. He talks about rather than saying, why, you know, why is this happening to me? Or why doesn't this person believe in me? Um, he flips it and says, why is this happening for me? How will I turn it into an opportunity? Which I, which I think I, it's a great quote. Um, uh, you know, and you know, I've been made redundant before, so uh, you, you could you could take the negativity from that, or you, as you've said, Cindy, you can take the positivity from that and say, okay, those are the choices that were made before, but I'm not defined by those. So what am I going to do about it? Am I going to sit and wallow, or am I going to get off a backside, and I'm going to move towards the outcome that I'm looking for? And you know, right now, you know, and I say this. If the worst happened and I was made redundant, I would like to think even today that I've got the necessary skills and desire to find the role that I think would be right for me anyway. I'm not saying it would, but I, yeah. but, but that that's my mindset. I am a positive individual anyway. And the, the bypass kind of said to me, that's what I was doing before. I'm going to be doing that tomorrow. Yeah. Well, the data and analytics space is such an important space. And even in this tough economic environment, I've seen people have to shift sectors or industries, but the jobs are still there. It's still a, it's still a great market, a tight market. So when you, um, you, you mentioned in Australia how a lot of the talent has come from abroad, but where do you recruit from talent? in in this tight labor market still certainly less from abroad than than we've ever done before and, and, and in the data space today because i've been here a while now the and you're right it's not it, it's not a huge market so you know the individuals who are talented anyway and we're actually all fighting over the same ones probably yes at the top end we always <laughs> it's are who's gonna bid the most yeah who's gonna <laughs> yeah. i don't know um take them to a rugby game <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So, so there's that element, but then there's the element of, you know, you also need a throughput, and so you need to bring the younger individuals through. So, you know, having internships, having graduate programs, etc., I think are in, are incredibly important for for any company. There's a couple of reasons behind that because the younger generation can actually see there's an in, there's an investment in them as well, which I think is incredibly important. So, as an as an employer, people naturally gravitate towards you. My team are a lot more gender diverse than they ever were when I when I first joined. Really? That, okay. Now I'm going to have to ask you the stats. Give me the stats. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I'll, I'll give you the numbers actually. So, <laughs> so previously in the team, when I first joined, you know, a team male and female, there was only there was only three ladies in the team. It was an incredibly low number. You know. So, you know, we're up to out 10, of how many? Out of 30. What was the total so you, team? Out of thirty. Talk, yeah. So you're talking, you know, a very small ratio. Now of the same ratio, we're, you know, we're up to almost ten. First of all, we've got individuals from different diversity, from ethnicity perspective yeah. in the team. You know, and and to me, it's I personally don't care. You know, who they are, where they come from, etc. Can they do the job, and will they fit into the team? You know, yeah. and they're, they're, they're the prerequisites. And as long as they can do that, it shouldn't make any difference. And having a, a diverse team actually has a better dynamic, first of all, you know, number one. And then if you're thinking about the outcomes that you're looking for, if you have a diverse team, then they have diverse opinions, which means you're reaching a far greater population of your customer data set than you would do if, if you had a more traditional one. So again, if you think about it just in data terms, you're always going to get better outcomes. Yeah, you see the blind spots more. So if I just if I just make that percentages, you went from ten percent from a gender viewpoint to a thirty percent, which is much better than the industry average, and much better than Australia as a country. That's uh, on average. That's great. Still needs to change. So for me, there are still areas where I believe that we can do better. So you know, I look at the the, the makeup of the team. 
predominantly they're able-bodied individuals, but there's a very large community of individuals with disabilities. And I would, we get the opportunity and somebody's of, of necessary caliber, I'd love to bring somebody in um, from, from a very different diverse background because I think that they would enrich the team anyway. Yeah. Are you also focusing on upskilling internally? So recruiting internally, but having people reskill, upskill and move within the organization? I think it's more to do with the skills and the new world that we're in, Cindy. So, I mean, you're, obviously we've talked about cloud and, and many individuals. It's a different skill set. So some of the things that we've done with AWS are X amount of people will go through and become solutions architect associate. And then we've got Teams website and all of that information up there. So FAQs, practice papers, etc. But the individuals who are passed will then become the mentors to the next group coming through. So because they've had the most relevant experience, they're the best ones to be teaching the next group to come through. So we found that upskilling works really well because those who weren't on the cloud wanted to be on the cloud. Although we both know they're both different site data centers and are actually in the cloud, but, but you know, we still know that as an outcome. <laughs> so, um, cause they felt that they were missing out. So we have that first of all, and then, you know, this cross skilling, so you don't have single point, uh, dependencies. So, you know, who knows how to use Tableau, who knows how to use MicroStrategy, et cetera, and building up their capability. We talked about things like dashboarding. Not everybody can do a Tableau dashboard, but it's great that if more than one can do them and they can guide others in doing a really good dashboard rather than a so-so dashboard, then you're going to get better outcomes. And then a the question with regard to the, the community is, how can we help them utilize the tools that have got? We, it's not just us that do it. You talked about partnerships. Well, the first partnership discussion that we had with AWS was, can we teach people about the cloud so they understand what the cloud is and, and we understand what you're, yeah, well, let, well we do a, a, a 101 bootcamp. So why don't we have them all there? Okay, and, and you guys are using S3. So let's give them a crash course, a, a, a freebie day on S3 and, and Redshift and uh, AWS. And then you've seen, you know, people using drones and, and cars for, they call them deep racer days. But effectively, although these are a lot of fun, people using scale electric with a sensor board on top of it, you're effectively within that trial period, putting together a, a, a driverless car. You know, so it's a self-driving car at the end of it by using that and using the skills behind it. And it's done in a fun way. And those are the kind of ones that I really enjoy because I think people learn the most from them. Um, it's also fun watching people crash drones. <laughs> I'm sure it is. So besides crashing drones, you mentioned uh, playing soccer for fun or football. So I have to ask you, who's your favorite football team or soccer team? Uh, yeah, so I get a lot of stick for this, by the way. So um, my favorite team is is West Ham United um, because of where I'm born. So my boys have got two choices. They either support their father's team or they, or they live in the shed. That's their choice. There you go. Yeah. That, well, same here. It's Leeds United or nothing. What, uh, so you you're, you're, you're near the, the world famous Melbourne cricket club. Um, so are you cricket or rugby or neither? From England, the sports typically are for us, are you right? Football, soccer or cricket. So they're the two. Yeah. And yeah, we've been to the MCG many times. In fact, I took my offshore team to the MCG on a day off to do an MCG tour because obviously they're cricket nuts as well. Yeah. So they found that one of the best days of their life to do a tour of the MCG. Um, and I found that the outcomes I get on doing things of that nature for, for the team members, they did should repay you back in, in you know, hundredfold yeah. off the back of that because the willingness to do things. Yeah, I'm sure they will never, ever forget it. When I was in Melbourne last September, or yeah, it was last September. Um, so I, I didn't go to the tour because I'm like, look, I track four sports. There's no way I'm going to learn cricket. So I went for a jog along the water there, which was, e and I saw it from the outside. So equally... Yeah impressive enough for me. So if I think about all the things that you've shared with us, Craig, if I think about kind of the three key takeaways, nothing like a life-changing event to give you a new perspective on how data from the patient perspective can be used as, as one, a cloud-first mentality, 
And then really moving your vendors, putting them on notice, they're either going to be a vendor or they're going to be a partner to help you extract value. And then maybe as an individual also, always be broadening your skills. Sometimes that means changing a job. Any other key takeaway or did I get that? No, 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 you're right. I I would say have a clear strategy when you go into a role. Right, so 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 look at the outcomes that you that you want, and make sure that they align with with the business goals. Right, so then people say to me, "Oh, writing a data strategy is really easy." It, it's if you do it properly, it's not quite as easy as you think. You can do a cookie cut eighty percent the same as everybody else, etc. But each data strategy should be aligned to to the industry you're in to the business that you've got, to the strategic goals of the company and, and to the outcomes people actually want to get from data and analytics. And, and Cindy, you, you all know probably more than me that lots of people want lots of different things. So so, so to me, having a clear strategy and, and, and staying true to that will give the outcomes that you're looking for. And my argument behind those kind of things are provide capability. So you're, you, the analytics that you're talking about, the insight, I don't think you can ever not give enough. So don't be a roadblock. Try and try and allow that to happen. Do find um, via your partnerships the low hanging fruit, so the reduction in costs, um, the optimization that, that you can look for, and absolutely reduce risk because you know at the, at the at the top end of the scale, the individuals who 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 run the company, they're very risk averse anyway, for obvious reasons, because these are long standing companies. So, so they want to know that you're making sure that you're protecting what I think are the crown jewels, which are, which is the data, because that uniquely positions you if you do it properly to potentially give you competitive edge. So I think, I think having a clear strategy is also a key outcome, Cindy. So yeah, absolutely. around business outcomes, a data strategy around business outcomes, and that breeding SQL Server siloed data marts no. like rabbits is not a data strategy. Yeah, I'll tell you that one off record. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Craig, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. You shared some personal things in the beginning, but I always like to ask, when you think beyond just a stock answer, what are you grateful for? Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, and, and the stock answers typically are, you know, health, family, and, and all of those kind of things. Which are true. Yes, yeah, they're absolutely I mean, true. Not that they're not true. They are. But I would argue that I've been thankful for the vast majority of the individuals that I've worked for. So, so leaders, what they provided to me throughout my career, because they've all provided something very different, but be it good or bad, by the way. But but predominantly, most of my experiences have been very good. So so I'm quite thankful for those because I would never have got where I am today without those individuals, without the time and the effort that, that a lot of them have put in, the, the insight that they provide me. You know, and, and I still talk to many of them today outside of work, and I bounce ideas off them because I find them to be an incredibly rich source of information, a great sounding board, because a lot of them got different perspectives to me as well. Yeah, I love that, Craig. I have said to some of my customers, my lifelong customers, some of my old bosses, you will always be my customer, regardless if we're changing money or not, because I just feel yeah. blessed by the people I've met in this industry ac- across 25 years now. Yes. So. Yeah. So Craig, I hope you get a Luna coffee today. And I look forward to, after all this COVID stuff, hopefully sharing a coffee with you, maybe along the water outside Melbourne Cricket Club. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be lovely. Cindy, thank you. Thanks very much this morning for for inviting me on as a guest. (laughs) Thanks for being here, Craig. Have a great day. Thank you. And you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Data Chief. To learn more about today's guest, recommend a future guest, or listen to more of the show, head over to thedatachief.com. If you have questions for Cindy or comments about the episode, give her a shout on Twitter at BI Scorecard. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot. Searching through your company's data for insights doesn't have to be complicated. ThoughtSpot makes it easy. 
With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Thank you.